At the beginning of the 1940s, the United States had not yet entered World War II. But nevertheless, world turmoil was beginning to affect all aspects of American life. In May 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt proclaimed an unlimited emergency. And as the country shifted to a wartime economy, unemployment dissipated. By 1942, the United States was at war, and Hennepin County Library staff struggled to keep library service intact. Bookmobile schedules were curtailed due to gas and tire rationing. The number of trips, for example, was cut from 12 to 8 a month. The bookmobile reached some stations and schools only once in two months. A major change in reading habits occurred. There was great demand for books about the U.S., ally countries, enemy nations, and most of all, technical information for the men and women working in the war plants. Also requested frequently were materials on raising chickens, which families undertook when meat was rationed, information on victory gardens, and all kinds of cookbooks and how-to books. The bookmobile logbook, kept by the librarians on a daily basis throughout the 1940s, reflected wartime concerns, library cutbacks, and the close relationships of the bookmobile staff and their patrons. Dayton would like a later edition of the World Book for next fall has 1921 edition. Cold, clear day. Everyone talked about the war. Brought in victory books from everywhere. Three bags full from Wyzetta. Everyone's busy. Not much help available and much war work. Mrs. Blanche wants recipes without sugar. Navy planes were all over the air. One plane crashed several weeks ago in Mrs. Palmer's backyard. One man killed. Bright day, strong winds. Mrs. Beecher gave us some delicious spice cookies with lemon frosting. School 12 has a lot of flu. Heard all about the Mudge Boy and his exploits over Germany. Mrs. Jacobson's youngest boy is home from North Africa with a discharge, had malaria twice. Mrs. Edelman was house cleaning, waiting for Olaf to beat the rugs. Told us a story about a worm and a glass of whiskey. Despite the restrictions of the war, bookmobile service went forward and overall library use grew. In fact, the county, out of necessity, bought a new bookmobile in 1942 to replace the aging Rio Speedwagon. Bookmobile driver Olaf Jacobson recalls experiences with those sometimes cantankerous vehicles of that era. The 1942 Dodge cab over engine, one that had the, the hood in order to, and just to lift up the hood, you had to take out 16, 16 screws on the other, outside of it to take the hood off. And uh, one time I was up at School 63 out of Hamill, and, and uh, the, it was boiling over. I can tell you the reason now. I'll tell you that, the reason why it was boiling over, too. But um, I went to this farmhouse in the, right next door to the school, and finally got a screwdriver from the lady so I could get it, get the hood off and then I had uh, a wrench to get the, take the thermostat out. It wasn't that bad to take the thermostat out so it wouldn't boil over. But when the truck was built in 1942, it was built by Olson Body Company out in, uh, out in Blaisdale or when some, Blaisdale or whatever on, um, in Lake, off of Lake Street. And apparently what they were doing was building this body with the, uh, with the cap off of the radiator. So sawdust was going into the radiator and plugging up the radiator, and then we'd always have problems until we finally got the radiator cleaned out. Then we would, um, and it was all right. 
The bookmobile logbook reflected the joy and relief as World War II came to an end. This is D-Day. Much excitement. V.E. Day. Official proclamation at 8 a.m. Libraries, schools open, all stores closed. Miss Berry still has her cold. Cold, windy day after 81 degrees on Sunday. Regular blizzard during most of the day. Excelsior and Minnetonka, etc., all closed up. Nothing open but schools, and we're closing after programs. Mrs. Dominic says Phil is with General Patton's forces and is still fighting. Exciting news of Japanese surrender. Not official, but good and promising. Japanese surrender came at 6 p.m. Most exciting. Holiday for two days, August 15th and 16th. By the end of the war, the bookmobile was making 300 stops, many of those stops in the burgeoning suburbs that were beginning to surround Minneapolis. Those were busy days for the bookmobile staff, as indicated by these logbook entries. Two hellish days. Same old story of trying to serve too many people in places in too short a time. Our usual two terrible days. Cedar Avenue and Bloomington. More people, all of them nice, but too many of them. More dogs and dog fights and too many babies. When the men and women get time to read all the books they borrow from the truck gets me. They all say, we can't get to the city. There's nothing to do, so we read. Olaf Jacobson talks about a typical day as a bookmobile driver. Well, we, uh, I'd get down to the library at 8 o'clock in the morning and get ready to load up. And I had a lot of uh, reserves to bring down and school books. We had 85 rural schools to deliver to at that time and uh, 24 branches. We didn't take all our branches at the same time, but we we didn't take all the schools at the same time either, but one school trip was 16, 16 trips, 16 uh, starting at St. Anthony over to uh, Osseo, three miles north of Osseo. But then we would, the librarian would come down about nine o'clock and we would leave for the, and then we would just keep on going until we were done with the route. We'd stop for lunch, of course, and and we would continue on until we were through. Sometimes it was 3 o'clock, sometimes it was 5 o'clock. The bookmobile staff always strove to provide library patrons with the materials they wanted, and they welcomed requests. Helen Young remembers that a slip of paper was used to record requests, and that the checkout procedure was equally simple, but effective. I think we just used little slips of paper, and uh, we had little pads, and wrote them down, and and, and um, we had everybody's name in order as we got to their homes on the bookmobile and um, with a rubber band. So we would just put the request in, the front, in front of their name and get it filled before the next time. And we had shelves <laughs> in the library for the bookmobile trips. And when they were filled, by the books got up there and were loaded for that particular trip. Helen Young also recalls how books for the system were ordered. Well, everybody had something to do with, with the input about books being ordered. And um, I mean, although we did have a process, I guess, by which everything was covered. But um, at that time, uh, we ordered a lot of books from St. Paul Book and Stationery from local companies and, um, and, then, and from individual publishers, because we had a lot of publishers who had representatives, Doubleday and, um, well, many of them. <coughs> um, Bennett Cerf was with whom? <laughs> uh, and, you know, all these, they had representatives, and the, all the encyclopedia people had representatives who came to call on us. And I remember being so amazed at Ethel Berry because some salesman would come in, maybe I'd never seen him before, maybe once in my life, and she said, well, good day, Mr. So, and good, good morning, Mr. So, and so, how are you? And, you know, I would just, how did she ever remember all those names? I found out how, how you do, do, do remember that, because I did too for a while. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, 
uh, they would come in and, and bring their book lists and and give you a fairly good discount for things of that sort. That's how we would order. But a lot of our things did come from local book dealers. The job of dealing with the new and growing demands for library service became the responsibility of Helen Young in 1947, when library director Ethel Berry retired. Ethel Berry had provided dedicated and inspired leadership for 22 years, with Helen Young serving as her assistant the last nine of those years. Helen Young remembers Ethel Berry. She was just a tremendous person. She loved to talk, and, and so she would tell, you know, Olaf and I heard stories like <laughs> going way back that's why we knew as much as we did because she was very good about telling us all kinds of things about people and about the um, earlier days in the library and and um, um, and she was very generous and she was terribly good to her staff <laughs> and um, she was just a, a wonderful warm person and she was very smart and very bright and and she knew how to work with people, how to get the things that we really needed. Appointed to assist Helen Young was Margaret Cutler. The library system was facing major challenges, mostly because it was limited to a one mill tax levy, which was totally inadequate to fund a library system for a rapidly growing population. A prime example of the growing suburbs was the city of Richfield, which had increased more than tenfold in population from 1300 in 1930 to more than 17,000 by the end of the 1940s. The community was served only by the bookmobile that traveled from block to block, circulating hundreds of books to the mobs of residents who met it. In 1947, her first year as director, Helen Young lobbied at the legislature for an extra mill tax levy. I just decided we had to have more money. and. Um, I mean, there just wasn't any, <laughs> there were no two ways about it. And so I asked the, the uh, library board and finally went over to the county commissioners and asked if we could not have an increase from one to two mills, permissive legislation. And um, well, nobody seemed to object to it, so we went over with a bill. <laughs> and that was when I learned a little bit about legislation. <clears throat> I sat over there hour on end, <laughs> waiting to catch different people, found out finally it was a man. Uh, we thought it was one of the counties around Minneapolis that was objecting, or that we would object, but it was not, apparently, and it was apparently this county up on the range, who, um, and it was Fred Sheena, I remember him very well. He was a delightful person, <laughs> I liked him, but I finally, you know, waylaid him and I said, Mr. Chena, why are you going to oppose this bill? Because really, you know, you're not even getting a tenth of one mil yet for the, for the range and, and we need it and it isn't going to affect you. You don't have to, you know, it's just permissive. And he sort of grinned and, and he said, okay. And so the bill went through beautifully. So we got, the, then the county commissioners, of course, had to be approached <laughs> and they did, um, they did approve it. Indeed, a last-minute qualifying clause had eliminated Hennepin County from levying the tax. Undaunted, Helen Young worked with the county commissioners and legislators to get the restrictive clause removed in 1949, thus paving the way for continued growth of the increasingly popular bookmobile service to the residents of suburban Hennepin County.